What's up, gang? Recently, I discovered a new kind of puzzle, or it new to me. It's called Battleship Solitaire, and it's kind of a cross between Sudoku and Battleship. So you have to place your ships here on this grid, and the amount of cells taken up by ships need to add up to these numbers here, like this. I really enjoy these, and of course, the first thought I had was, how can we write a solver to do this for us? So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to go over the rules of the game, a high-level game plan, and then I'm going to step through the code showing you how we're going to build it up. And we're going to talk about some combinatorics because it's going to get fun. So let's go. The rules of the game are pretty simple. The number for the row or column tells us the amount of cells that are taken up by ships. So this tells us that one cell in this column is going to be taken up by a ship and in this row. And so we can just click on these right here to rule out everything else. We can also click the zero to indicate that there's not going to be any ships here. So we're marking these as water. So one of the rules is that ships can't touch, not even diagonally. So we know right away we can rule out these two squares. Now, this row here only has four cells left. So we know that all these need to be taken up. We can see that this only has one, so we can rule out everything else. We know that there needs to be a space here because this ship is sideways. And so we know that it's got to have some empty space. This has a three left, so we know we have to fill this up. Now we know we can rule out these two squares because this is a one. Same here, we can rule these two out. We only have one remaining square here, so we need to fill that out. We only have one remaining square here, we need to fill that out. And we know we have uh, a four here, a one here, and a three. And so we're good to go. So let's talk about our high level game plan. First, we're gonna generate all the possible formations. Next, we're going to filter out from those formations the ones that don't follow the rules, which your ships can't overlap or touch, and they have to fit on the grid. We're going to filter out the formations that don't fit the counts for the rows and columns. And then we're going to filter out the ones that don't match those cells that are already given to us at the start. So we're going to solve this using Elixir, which is a really natural fit for this kind of problem. Immutability is built into the language, so it means we never have to worry about accidentally mutating a collection while we're evaluating one branch of the solution space. Lastly, it makes it really easy to run things in parallel right out of the box. So if that's something that we're going to end up leaning on, I'd like to have it. So with all that, let's jump into some code. All right, so we're going to start out with two main modules here. We have our solver. This is where our functions for actually generating our solution are going to go. And this is our formation. Right now, it's just a struct that has one field, which is called placements. This is going to be uh, some sort of value to indicate each ship, its position and its orientation. And our solution is going to be one of these formations. Next, we're going to add some high level functions to get all of the formations. So we're going to use a little bit of recursion here. Elixir allows us to pattern match so that we have two cases of the same function, one of which when we have a value that's the head and one that is the tail and then another one where our list is just empty. So this value represents the ships that we're going to be placing. We're going to, for each one of them, we're going to generate all the possible locations, and then we're going to flat map over that, getting all of the formations, recursively placing the rest of the ships for each of those possible places. So we're going to use a for comprehension here. This just really makes it easy to go over all of the permutations. So if you're not familiar with these kind of comprehensions, what we're going to do is assign column and row for each one of these items off the list in order for each list. And that's going to let us get every possible combination. So possible locs here is going to give us every possible set of coordinates on our grid for a ship. We're going to iterate through all our lists. And right now this isn't actually doing anything. Next, we're going to actually start placing these ships. So for each coordinate, we're going to create a tuple here that is a, the ship that we're placing and its coordinates. And then we're going to call this a placement and we're going to use this in our place ship function. And this is really just going to push this tuple onto the front of our list here and then update our formation. And so we also need to account for the fact that a ship can be placed vertically or horizontally. So that's what we're going to do here. So now our placement is the ship, its coordinates, and the orientation. And you can see we've updated our forward comprehension here so that we're generating each set of coordinates as well as a vertical version and a horizontal version. So now we need to actually take care of the cells that the ship takes up. 
So we've got two definitions here, one for vertical and one for horizontal. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a range over the starting point um, up to the last place that it'll take up. We're adding a set of functions here to get the size of the ship. So right now we're only worried about our battleship and our cruiser, and we're going to make our list of ship cells. We've got our ship cells, and what we're going to do is we're going to use this to filter out any placements that would have a ship going off the grid. So we're going to pass the cells into this all cells available function, and this is just going to make sure that every column and row that our ship takes up fits on the grid. So if we go back to our plan, we are generating all possible formations, and right now we're filtering out the ones that don't fit on the grid. Next, we want to actually handle that ships can't overlap or touch, so that's what we're going to do. In order to do that, we're going to keep track of all the cells that are taken up on the board for each formation. So now when we place a ship, we're going to add this cells field. We're going to update our ship cells function so that instead of just a list of the cells it takes up, now it's a map from the coordinates to a value. For now, the value is just going to be ship, but we know later that we're going to need to get more advanced with it. So that's why this isn't just a set. And next, when we place our ships, we're actually going to merge the ship cells, that is the cells taken up by the ship we're placing, into the cells that this formation has right here, and we're going to update this formation. So now for each formation, we have a map of what cells are already taken up. Next, we're going to do just a little refactoring here. So our first step in this pipeline is actually going to connect this placement with the cells that it takes up. And then we're going to filter out a formation if its cells aren't all available. So this means we're only going to be placing ships if our cells are available. Next, we're going to update our all cells available function. And in addition to checking to make sure that it fits on the grid, we're also going to make sure that none of these cells are already taken up. So now we're taking care of preventing two ships from occupying the same space. Next, we're going to move on to worrying about some of the counts and the rows. So we're going to add a field here called counts. This is going to be a map where it has two keys, the row counts and the column counts. And each of these is going to be a map from the column or row number to the amount of cells taken up. Next, we're going to actually start keeping track of our counts. So every time we place a ship, we're going to update our counts like so. This is going to take the existing counts and it's going to use this as our starting value. And then we're going to reduce over every pair of coordinates that the ship takes up and bumping up the row and the column. Next, we're going to add another module to represent our clues. So this is going to be a struct that right now just has our row counts and our column counts. This is what we're going to be checking against at the end. So we've got our clues. We're going to be passing these in at the top. That's going to go into this do get all formations function. This is going to recurse all the way through. When we get to our final formation, once all of our ships are placed, then we're going to filter out any of them that don't satisfy all of the counts. And what this is going to do is going to take our counts that we're building up as we're placing each ship, and it's going to make sure that it actually matches the counts that are in the clues given to us. So looking at our plan here, we're now making sure that our solution fits the counts for the rows and the columns at the end. Next, we're going to do the same thing with our cells. We're just going to update our clues to have a field that is going to be the cells. These are going to represent the spaces that are revealed in the beginning of the puzzle. So when our ship that's revealed is this one by one ship, which I call a buoy, uh, they call it a submarine, I call it a buoy, we'll be able to see the entire thing. Some puzzles will start you off with a piece of a ship and all you'll be able to see at it is that it is one end of the ship but you won't know how many other squares it takes up. And you can get any of the sides of the ship, or you can just get a square to indicate there's going to be no ship there at all. And every now and again, you'll just be given the middle of the ship, and you'll know that the ship continues in one of these two directions, but you won't know which. So now when we're placing our ship cells, we're actually going to be indicating that if it's horizontal, the first piece will be a left and the last piece will be a right that if the ship is vertical, the first piece will be called top, the last will be called bottom, and all of the middle pieces we're just going to refer to the, as the body. So now our map of ship cells, not only do we know what cells are taken up, but we also know what part of a ship is currently occupying that space. We're going to add in the math for our remaining ship sizes. And now if we satisfied all of the counts, we're going to check to make sure that we satisfy all of the cells. And this is going to work in a similar way where we're going to iterate through all of the cells that are given to us at the start. And we're going to make sure that that value matches whatever is in our solution. And 
this third argument here, water, is just the value we're going to return if nothing is placed there. So if we haven't placed anything there, we can safely assume it's going to be water. So checking back in on our plan, we are checking our rows and column counts, we're checking the revealed cells, we're checking to make sure that our ships fit on the grid and that they don't overlap. The last thing we need to do is just make sure that they don't touch. First thing we're going to do is just add a field into our formation module to keep track of the grid size. And we're going to use that when generating the surrounding coordinates. So for every time we're placing a ship, we're going to get all of the cells that are surrounding it and we're going to mark those as water. This might look a little complicated, but we're just going to make a list of all of the cells that surround each cell as we're placing it down. And we're going to dedupe that list and drop all of the ones that don't fit on the grid. And so when we update the current cells for this formation, we're going to keep track of the places where we know have to be water, as well as that we're placing our ships now. And so now, technically, we can get the answer because we're handling this last rule here. All right, so now it's time to try it out. We're going to try it on this 6x6 six six puzzle. I've got our clues and the ships to place set up here, and there's nothing left to do but run it. This is more than just taking a while. This is going to take literally forever. And to understand that, now we need to start talking about how big this solution space actually is here and what we're going to do about it. So the issue we have is that we're starting off at the top. You want to imagine a tree where the first layer is trying to place the largest ship in each of the possible places. So there's 120 different places that we could do. And for each of these possibilities, we also have to calculate all of the possible values for the second ship for just this first one and then for the second place that first ship could be we need to evaluate all of the possibilities and so on so that's 116 more possibilities for every one of our top level nodes and for each one of those we need to now place the next ship so that's another 124 and i think you can see where this is going so to calculate the problem space we need to multiply 120 which is the total possible placements for the first ship, times 116, which is the placements for the next ship, 124 times 108, and for the 10 by 10, this is what we need to do. This comes out to about, I don't know, nine quintillion, whatever this number is. Spoiler alert, it's too big. We're gonna be waiting a long time for a solution. So we're gonna have to start making some optimizations. The first optimization we're gonna make is Actually, the first thing that you would do as a human player, which is look for the rows and columns that are zeros. And we know that these all need to be marked as water. So if we can mark off even just these 16 cells as guaranteed to be water, that cuts our problem space down drastically. First of all, it means that for each level that we're going through, we can rule out any placement that would take up any of these cells. Most importantly, if we're eliminating possibilities at the very top level, that's not only 20 some positions that we're ruling out for that first ship, that's 20 of those entire trees that we're ruling out. So the name of the game here is going to be eliminate as high up the tree as we can. So how we're going to do this is we're just going to look at our row counts and our column counts from the clues and any row or column where the count is zero. Every cell along that column and row, we know that we can mark as water. So to get an idea of how many possibilities this is ruled out, this is the kind of solution space that we're looking at now. With our sample problem, our first ship now only even has 33 possibilities. So this has let us rule out about 75% of the entire top level trees. And going each level down, we can see that the amount of possibilities is substantively less. Our problem space is still huge, but this will actually finish running in under five minutes. So we're on to something. The next one is actually a really small optimization, but it's so easy. We're just going to add it now. And this is for any cells that were given in our clues that were told are water. We're just going to mark this in our cells as water. So we don't even ever check placing a ship there. This isn't a big one, but keep in mind if this rules out a few top level trees, it's worth it. One of the next things we would do as a human player is take the cells we're given and add water surrounding them just to rule out even more possibilities. Since we know that ships can't touch, we know that all this space has to be protected. Same here. And even if all we're given is a middle of a ship, we know that at least the diagonals have to be water because the ship can only be vertical or horizontal. So this might not seem huge on its own, but for some cells, this will let us rule out up to eight more possible squares. The way we're going to do this is we're going to take all of the cell clues that we're given 
for all the ship pieces, we're going to generate the water coordinates that surround them, and we're going to add that into our cells map right away. So we're going to generate the surrounding water similar to how we did before, except this case, we're going to add a filter function. And so each ship that we're given is going to have a way to say what cells we can and can't rule out. So taking a look at all the cell clues that were given right from the start, this has allowed us to cut the problem space even more. Again, notice that we've cut our top level trees in half again, and that each level of the tree, the possibilities are getting smaller and smaller. So this is the first point at which we can actually solve our six by six in under a minute. One of the biggest issues we have is that we're placing a ship and then we're evaluating the entire tree below it, even if it's totally invalid. For example, if the clues tell us that there's only one cell taken up in this column, if we try placing our ship here and we exceed that, we should bail out right away. We, we don't need to compute the entire tree if we know that from the first ship that we've placed, none of those formations are going to be any good. So that's what we're going to tackle next. So first, we're going to refactor a little bit here. We're going to move our filter function from the end actually in the middle of our pipeline before we start recursing. So we're not doing anything different yet. We're still just checking to see if it satisfies all the counts and cells if we're on the final ship. Next, we're going to update our function that checks to see if we satisfied all of our counts. If we've just placed the final ship, we want to use equals to check to make sure that the count exactly matches what's in the clues. But anywhere before that in the tree, we just want to make sure it's less than or equal to the final count. So as long as we haven't gone over, we still consider it viable. This actually, this is so huge. This actually gets us down to a solution space that looks something like this. This is a totally tractable number, but we're going to keep going. We're also going to take the same approach when checking against the actual clue cells that were given. So if we placed our final chip, nothing changes. We want to make sure that the value matches exactly as what's supposed to be there or that we don't have anything there. But if we're anywhere else along the way, we're just making sure that we haven't tried to place something in a cell that we already know is going to be something else. This is also huge. And so at this point with our optimization so far, we can actually finally solve a 10 by 10 in just a matter of seconds. We've got a couple more changes to make though. One thing that bothers me is that for our one by one ship, our buoy, we're still checking both the vertical and the horizontal versions of them, even though it's a one by one, it's gonna be the same either way. We're gonna update our possible locations function so that we're gonna check out what orientations each ship has available. And for a buoy, we're gonna say it can only be vertical and for any other ship, it could be vertical or horizontal. This might not seem like much, but most of our puzzles actually have three to four buoys at the end. So if we can cut each of those last three trees in half, that's a win. And this actually cuts us down to about two and a half seconds. So we're trucking along. And we've got one last optimization we're gonna make, and this one might be my favorite. We're going to add another definition of our possible locations function, and this one is going to run if the ship that we're placing matches the last ship that we just placed. We're going to do this because if we've ruled out every cell up to E6 for our first destroyer, we know we don't need to check them again for the second destroyer and the third one. So this is going to look at where we placed our last ship and rule out everything before that. And this final improvement is so huge that it lets us feel like we get our solution instantly. With this and the rest of our optimizations, we can actually get a solution while only looking at less than a thousand different formations. So that's a dub in my book. And now there's nothing left to do except see our solution in action. We did it. All right, gang, I've really enjoyed these puzzles, but even more, I've enjoyed getting to write this solver. Hopefully you enjoyed it too. Hopefully you learned something. Shout out to Luke for the perfect puzzle site. Link will be in the description as well as the code. Peace.